Thank you quickly through uh, some of the remarks I have, uh, and then we'll take a short break before we go into our final level center today. So, uh, again, thanks to all of our token dealers and sponsors for making this possible. John Taylor from LG Electronics dropped by yesterday, and I, I didn't recognize him, but uh, uh, we, we do appreciate the part of support we have. So, I'm just going to rephrase something I, I said yesterday to help make the points I'm trying to make later uh, about this. So these are the, the key uh, attributes of next gen that really support better alerting. Uh, Geo-targeting, rich media, deep indoor reception, device wake up, resilient, resilient and all IP integration, meaning that yes, it's one way, but it natively integrates with other IP networks for a return path or <coughs> whatever you want to do with it. Uh, the, the FCC actually calls Next Gen TV broadcast internet, and they have taken steps to improve the uh, deployment rate and make it easier to provide public services and commercial services. So we, we have some, some ways to go on the regulatory side, but there is a recognition this really uh, this came during the pandemic when we were trying to bridge the, the broadband gap that we've talked about with, uh, with the signal. So, when, at least when I started working with, when we found an AWAR, my thought was primarily that we will be sending the alert information directly from the call tower to individual receivers. And I think that will continue to happen, probably will be the principal way of delivery. But we do have to think about this concept of a, a network of networks where you're talking about broadband, broadcast integration, a way to extend the iPods. And it can be, the signal, the message can be received and retransmitted across other networks. It's not unlike what we did back in 2005 in our experiments with the White House that in part led to the president creating iPods. But we can do it. It's much more robust. Robust now is all IP. We're not encapsulating anything. So we could, it could be first net. Um, we, we, we can't encrypt it, as we mentioned yesterday, we need to. We can encrypt for authorized users, first responders. Also, it's, it's perfect for the intelligent transportation system, uh, which I'll talk about in just a second. And, uh, the Internet of Things it doesn't have to be people. So within the home, I just pull these from the Internet. There's not an ATSC receiver in, the, in these diagrams, but the whole concept is if the home has a dongle or a set-top box or a new TV set, uh, it can connect to other devices in the home, including smartphones and laptops and tablets. So. Think of the ATSC 3.0 receiver in the home as a kind of media hub. It can integrate with all of these other devices. And so it gets around the, the problem that was identified in the FCC's notice of inquiry. How do you do streaming over streams? How do you do alerting over streams and media? And the response from the, from the uh, industry was it's damn hard. Not sure we can do it. But you don't have to do it if you can take the, the alert off the air, go to a set top box that's always listening for that signal. Of course, the thing can be for, for watching television, but if it gets the alert, you can just put it on the screen as an overlay over whatever you're streaming. So these are uh, examples of the kinds of products that are coming on the market. This is a dongle from a uh, company that's based in Taiwan and, and Atlanta. You can see it's got multiple tenders for uh, television viewing and it uh, can carry, can handle 1.0 and 3.0 is what I'm saying. And uh, it can handle a whole lot of things. But this is gonna be at a pretty reasonable price point. It's also more of a set-top box. The goggles are optimized for computers, but uh, you can see HDMI out, and it will have Wi-Fi and Ethernet. Could have Bluetooth as well. 
So it's not just the home. We talked a bit about connected cars yesterday. I think there's a tremendous opportunity for using Clio for connected cars. And the, the car you begins to know more about this than I do, but as I understand ITS, the whole communication system is based on extremely short range systems. Even if they graduate to 5G, they, it's gonna be very hard to build it out. That network is subject to grid failure or congestion or hacking. With 3.0, at minimum, it could be a backstop for reaching all these vehicles in an entire metro area that you can geographically target for one transportation corridor. And I was, I'd like to pass along any, any positive press I get. Uh, I was quoted at this, at the uh, ATSC annual meeting, saying we, we have to work with the manufacturers and the, the third party OEMs to put in the equipment. Dell, Dell has done a lot around this. It's also clear from talking to people in the ITS sector that we also need to talk to the transportation authorities that are creating the standards for what kind of radios a vehicle should have, the infrastructure and the vehicle. So they accept the concept of VIA, it used to be vehicle, vehicle, or vehicle infrastructure, now it's VIA everything. And uh, we think the Rio could be a major, major problem solver for this industry, which also has regulatory problems. They lost half of their designated spectrum to uh, wireless cable providing this up. Yes, sir. Uh, when it comes to cars, it's essentially... Can you use the mic? Oh, sorry. When it comes to cars uh, and potential alerts, could the cars actually end up doing it if you're on the roadway and there's a flood in front of you? Uh, is, is, is that an example of, of, of what an alert might look like for a person just sitting in their car and wondering, hey, can I drive through the street? Yeah, so so there's there's communicate there's vehicle vehicle communication, and then there's uh, one to many communication. So for instance, uh, a lane closure could be transmitted over the air. Just like now, I'll be my example is if you ever get in your car and you turn on an FM radio, can you receive music? Right. So so you can you can take a, a lane closure. M dot or Del dot or VA Virginia Department of Transportation can close a road or a lane. They know that ahead of time. That can be transmitted to the car. Now, with, with what you're talking about is is is, is vehicle via and and vehicle back to a, uh, a a location, right? So, for instance, how many times have we ridden down the highway? And there is a big truck tire that just blew up, and there's a big piece of rubber and debris in the room. For those of us who use Waze, we can report that, and it and it gets sent back. Right? So, so if you could think, if you think about Waze on steroids, then then yes, the, eventually they want to get the vehicle to the vehicle, and vehicle and, and many to the vehicles. So all that's being thought about in in the automotive world. So that's why I said yesterday that the car guys, the car manufacturers, they want everything. They want 5G, they want 4G, they want uh, they want a, a satellite. So so they I think they all want to cover their cover their bases with any form of communication. Because the reality is that once you build the chips and have these software defined radios in them, it's just a matter of stamping out the, the chips. Somebody said yesterday, somebody mentioned yesterday about FM radio, FM receivers being built into, 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 uh, into, into cell phones, and, and that's true. They just haven't turned them on. But can you imagine cell phone guys not turning on underneath? You know, I, I think that would be a problem. So, so really, it's, it's, to answer your question is, yeah, it's all being thought about. Uh, again, we did that. Done a demo based on geolocation in Seoul, Korea. I mentioned that. I don't know if you were here yesterday, but uh, but we were around Seoul, Korea. Based on your your, your uh, GPS location, you were getting different content sent to you. So for you know, in, the, in the world of 
autonomous cars or even you know driver just drivers that's that's a big deal and also with the payment that's the other thing so so if I answer your question so so um, the, the, the resilience in the face of power failures are these guys I think about the um, <laughs> The really the back on I-95 from here in Richmond in January <clears throat> when all those cars were stranded. But uh, you got examples. I showed this yesterday. A couple of them. This is cellular outage in the Gulf region after uh, Hurricane Ida, which was a, a, about a year ago, over a year ago. Cellular was highly compromised and got wiped out. It had been for full power TV stations they were here. And it's not just storms. We have other incidents where we need the resilience. Part of the, part of the key to it is you need uh, battery powered devices to receive it. And a disclosure, I'm not here selling anything, but I think it's important for you to understand that not all of this is theoretical in terms of implementation, but the market is actually responding Rev is uh, part of mine. Um, we they have an existing company that's been in business for 14 years and use them to get their radio RDS, which is how you get the name of the artist and the song on your car radio to do alerting. And uh, they're concentrated in California and Gulf states. They have a license with a shake alert to get out your earthquake early warning. We now know how to arbitrage the different ways to get people, usually give people a warning, but you have to get that alert out really, really fast to get kids under a desk or to stop the surgery or to open the firehouse door before the power goes out. And uh, this is the receiver they use now. Matt, you got one with you? Yeah. Uh, Already in the 40 in the pipeline, and uh, this can be used for APSC 3 
go pointed toward toward uh, toward emergency information. But uh, I really I used to be a lobbyist, so I was head of the association of public television stations, as, as I mentioned yesterday. And I know that uh, I'm very confident that the coalition it can't just be the broadcast. It can't just be commercial or just public. It has to be organizations represented in this room. I, I'm pretty quick, pretty confident that we can secure some dedicated federal funding if, if the grant route doesn't prove productive. Because there is a, there is a big constituency in Congress for improving the work, which just hasn't been developed. But uh, anyway, uh, there, there are business models all sorts of different ways to to get to this uh, to improve the system. I, I was a little surprised that the uh, that the, lot, the associations that represent the emergency managers, to my knowledge, based on what they told me, they did not ask for any dedicated funding uh, in these legislations. But uh, I think the opportunity is there. So uh, we've got just a couple of minutes before we. Um, sure, I think I mentioned it to you in the hallway yesterday, and, and, you know, another good venue for this type of activity, if you're trying to get the word out, is something like an IEDM conference, just loaded with emergency managers, you know. But uh, one of the things I'm curious, you didn't show, I'm curious about like a Roku, a lot of people buy Roku-like devices, then there's an Amazon has theirs, and I think Google or Android has theirs. Um, how, did, how is it costly? Could, they, could that could ATSC 3.0 could that capability be built into one of those devices? And if so, how much would it? I mean, I, I see what you know Matthew was showing with his uh, and what you were showing on the screen there. But I imagine you could do the same thing with a streaming device like a Roku, right? And how expensive would that be? How much would that cost? How much would that add to the cost? I bought one for thirty dollars, you know, a couple weeks ago. There's active work uh, amongst uh, multiple uh, providers of set-top boxes, which is essentially what a Roku device is. Uh, that and dongles that, that John mentioned uh, to incorporate ATSC3 capabilities in those. Uh, we are uh, highly focused on getting ubiquitous um, distribution of a, uh, a low-cost Roku set-top type device or a dongle uh, available as quickly as possible to all people in the United States. The reason for that is this. You'll recall yesterday that I just talked about <clears throat> this requirement that the FCC has imposed on all broadcasters to simulcast their ATSC-3 program, programming in ATSC-1. In other words, if you're an ATSC station or a station that wants to convert over to ATSC 3, the FCC says all that programming that you're running has to be able to be received in an ATSC 1 environment because we don't want to, quote, disenfranchise, end quote, current viewers on legacy equipment. So uh, they said to broadcasters, rather than making it mandatory the way they did from analog to digital, this is going to be voluntary. Rather than doing it on a nationwide basis, we're going to make you do it on a market by market basis. And we're going to make you do this simulcast. Well, if you simulcast your program, you're an ATSC, you're a broadcast station that wants to convert over to ATSC 3, you have to find a home for all your ATSC 1 programming. That means you have to go to the other broadcasters in the market that aren't moving over to 3.0 and say, please, will you host my program? They'll say yes, but the quid pro quo for that is that their uh, programming, their primary network type programming, has to be carried on your station in 3.0. So it eats up most of the ATSC3 capacity. We want to get rid of that simulcasting requirement. And the way to do that is to, to go right after what the FCC's concern is, which is to say, we don't want to disenfranchise current viewers, so you give them an inexpensive, 
dongle type device or Roku set top box type device that receives ATSC3 over the air, plugs into their legacy set that's a 1.0 set, and suddenly they can receive 3.0 programming. If you go there and you, then you go back to the FCC and said, your concerns have been met. You'll recall when we went from analog to digital, the government gave you coupons for a converter box, remember that? That's what this essentially is. These are essentially converter boxes, but they're in a, in a form factor of a, a dongle or a Roku device. There are many companies that, are, that we're working with that are putting 3.0 capacity in those. We want to get those out as quickly as possible, at low cost as possible, incorporate them into the devices so that we can get rid of the simulcast requirement so that we can have complete access to all of our 3.0 capacity, not just for video services, but for other data casting services, the primary one of which is an advanced emergency informing. We have all sorts of other things. We have a whole process that, that Dell is ahead of called DDAS, Data Delivery as a Service. We think we can reuse a portion of our spectrum, our channel, our six megahertz, that is more than just television. We do all sorts of data casting. Advanced emergency informing is just one of them. So if I have a, you know, if Roku, so Roku, for example, could decide to build, yes. put this chip in a and they Roku, are. and they, you know, not some additional dongle, but right. the Roku, because I've tied it over, I could six out of a USB, right. sorry, out of a HDMI, uh, right. I guess port the back of my TV, my Roku is in those thirty dollars for right. the device. How much does this add to the cost of that? We think that, and we've talked to a number of dongle and and um, and set top box makers, and I can't I can't make a statement for them, but we think that the sweet spot is in the thirty forty dollar range to have a dongle that has a PSC three capability that has an HDMI port so that you can stick it into your set and it will, will carry the ATSC3 programming on an ATSC1 set. Is that set. on top of my existing cost of $30 for this? No, you would, that, okay. the, the one, the one, the one, the one, uh, so like streaming and we'll do ATSC for $30, $40. We'll do everything. Okay. And that's what we're, yeah, it's, it's an SOC, a system on a chip. Right. We've developed a chip with our friends at Sankia Labs in, in India, and that's exactly what we're demonstrating now the ability to do to use a system on a chip within the, 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 the device and we're as I say we're having conversations with multiple um, set-top box manufacturers and dongle manufacturers including Roku that would include uh, 3.0 in a cost-effective way. And real quick question what is it used as an antenna? It has built an antenna. Okay. Doesn't need anything big it's already. Well it's mostly UHF fans. Okay. So in UHF fans it's a lot smaller. Right. Okay. It's harder. Okay, we got, I'll take one more question, then we got to take a break. This is a, a little bit more, or a little less of a question, more of just a plug. Um, you mentioned the funding and the advocating for the funding. Um, as the vice chair for IEM's Government Affairs Committee, I would say, if you have suggestions for um, funding allocations and funding additions that need to be made, we work throughout the year um, directly with the staffers and the folks on both the House and the Senate side, as well as our partners at FEMA um, on helping develop those budget and make recommendations. And so we, um, we, and we do it in coordination with both NEMA, the National Emergency Management Association, and Big Cities EM, um, and we will typically um, all sign on to those recommendations together. So if this group has a recommendation that they want us to get behind in terms of um, support on a specific alerting um, line item, an alerting addition, let us know, and, and we'll be happy to put it in front of our membership because, again, that's, uh, the, the one of the biggest um, ROIs that we have back to our membership is our ability to advocate for stuff like this on the hill. Okay, well, my work is done. I think we get to go home now. <laughs> no, it's definitely let's talk. I'm so glad that uh, mine's back in here. Matt? Yep. Yeah. Real quick. So I wanted to, because we, we spent nine years lobbying the FCC and the cell industry to get the FM chip in the phone. Um, and they perceived it as a, comp 
the FM radio, free FM radio as competition to their streaming audio business, music business. So that's why it didn't happen. So what we're doing, we have the the FM chip and the and the ATSC 3.0 chip in here. So what's important when you when Jerry showed the coverage map, what happens when you leave the TV coverage area and you're in a mobile environment and you're running away from an earthquake, disaster, or fire, it will automatically roll over to the FM coverage, which are 14,000 stations existing. So we have a seamless alerting platform. It could even have the NOAA weather radio chip in it, but we. And this, this consumes the vertices that come from, as Mike said yesterday, which are really the important data, and then creates, which is a polygon, and then create, processes that, and then displays it if it's in the polygon or outside the polygon. So, and then, so this fills that gap where internet, cell, and the power's out, and also it fills the, uh, the gap when, when mobile, and wakes you up in the middle of the night. So those are the things that Thanks. it's important. Uh,